Well, hello and welcome. So my name is Amy Young. I am a core faculty member here at the Center for Positive Organizations. And I also coordinate the Airly Positive Research Incubator series that we are doing today. So I've always enjoyed coordinating the incubator series in, in large part because I think it it's a microcosm of what the Center for Positive Organizations is all about. Um, at the incubator sessions, faculty can bring their research and share it with colleagues in a very safe environment. So it is a place where you can bring ideas, you can bring preliminary research, you can have questions, and you're going to get support from the other faculty members. It's uh, a place where it's not just about informing the audience, but getting support and help along the way. So some of you may know about the center, but if you don't, I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. So for the past 16 years, the center has been the hub of positive organizational scholarship. And our mission has been to foster high-performing organizations by identifying, developing, and empirically validating practices. So it's a world-class center, and we share transformational research. Um, and we, are, we disseminate it through articles, books, tools, teaching material, and events, and also organizational partnerships. So my first impression of the center I want to share with you, there, there were two takeaways for me. The first was that I noticed, you know, if you go onto the center's website, this group of researcher, researchers are very prolific. There's a lot of peer review articles that were influential in making this field happen, and the list is vast. That was my first observation. My second observation is that the, the faculty, the researchers that are part of the center, are the most generous, warm, and supportive people that I've ever met. And I've learned that these actually go together. How about that? The reason why this group is so prolific is the fact that they support each other, that they help each other along the way, and they bring everyone up. And so that's, you know, I think the incubator sessions really demonstrates that you know, part of bringing people up is to actually be able to share work halfway baked, as Kim Cameron would say. So um, at this point, I would like to call up Wayne Baker. So he is currently the faculty director of the Center for Positive Organizations, and he also was the director when the center was founded. So help me welcome Wayne. Well, thank you, Amy, and welcome, everyone. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. Uh, now, Jane Dutton was supposed to be delivering these remarks, and unfortunately, she got called away at the very last minute, and so I'm going to do my best to channel Jane and to deliver her remarks for her. Um, Jane, as you know, was one of the three founders of the center and the movement of positive organizational scholarship. Um, a distinguished university professor, one of the rarest honors that our university bestows on anyone. And she has a very long history with Terry Adderley and Kelly Services. Uh, she's been a friend of mine for a very long period of time. And a fact that you might not know, she's actually godmother to my son Harrison. So, so I'll re read her remarks on her behalf in honor of Terry. I appreciate the opportunity to speak for a few minutes about Terry Adderley, for whom the Positive Research Incubator was named and who was the first very generous donor to the Center for Positive Organizations. His gift, shepherded by Frank Wilhelm from Ross Development, was a gift that really allowed us to form a center and hire wonderful people to make it a reality. Terry passed away on October 9th this year, so it is fitting to commemorate his memory at this 200th Adderley Positive Research Incubator Session. Terry Adderley was a quintessential Michigan man. He was very proud of being both an undergrad and MBA graduate of the Ross School of Business. 
Terry served on the visiting committee for Ross multiple times, and he also funded the William Russell Kelly Professorship in honor of his father. Jane was honored to be the first holder of that chair, and we know that Kim Cameron feels honored to be the second. Terry loved everything about Ross and about Michigan. Terry was also a quintessential businessman. He loved business and his role in society. This is one of the reasons why he was so proud of being the son of Russ Kelly, who was the original founder in 1946 of Kelly Services, now a global talent solutions company. Kelly Services was the inventor of the temporary employment industry. It was conceived in part to provide ways for women to support their families through work. It was this passion about business being a force for good that convinced Terry to give to the center. He believed, uh, he believed in the importance of trust and integrity. He felt the center could play a role in emphasizing and perpetuating these values. He also was deeply interested in the employment relationship and the importance of work-related innovation. He felt the center's mission and vision were aligned with these values as well. He also felt that, quote, human potential was a terrible thing to waste. Thus, in 2009, he generously gave a $1 million unrestricted gift to the center, which has allowed us to make this vision a reality. So on behalf of everyone who has benefited from and who has been inspired by the center, we thank you, Terry Adderley. We thank you for your belief and investment in the center, the students, the faculty, and all the business people who have been touched by our work. So we are also honored to have Dean Scott Drew here today. So Scott's relationship with the center actually goes way back, at least a decade, uh, when he first came to the University of Michigan. So prior to his appointment as dean, he was uh, an associate faculty member of our center. And the key elements of this uh, positive organizational scholarship can be evident in all of his work whether it's on leadership, team performance, or organizational transformation. And nearly 10 years ago today, Scott presented his research titled, Assuming the Mantle, Unpacking the Process by Which Individuals Internalize a Leader Identity. So this was at the 54th incubator session on December 16th, 2008. So we are very grateful for Scott's continuing support of the center and the importance of building positive organizations. So I'd like you to help me welcome Scott Dean Daru. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, observing and watching those pictures flash by brings back many fond memories of getting to interact with Terry. And what I, uh, what I most remember uh, about uh, uh, him is just how proud uh, he was of all of you who have created this really special community. Uh, as Amy mentioned, 16 years ago, the vision for founding uh, our faculty, founding uh, this field uh, of positive organizational scholarship, uh, which was the initial seeds of what we know today as the Center for Positive Organizations. And uh, many, if not all, of those folks who are around the table uh, imagining what could be uh, in this field of positive organizational scholarship are still here today. And you see many of them in the room of Gretchen and Bob, Kim and Wayne and, and Jane and Spirit, of course. Uh, but it's really remarkable what has been created over this time frame. Uh, if you think about uh, the last 16 years uh, with the emergence of the center, uh, the building of a community, not just here in Ann Arbor, not just here at the University of Michigan, but across the globe, of researchers and scholars and practitioners who are all interested and passionate about this field of positive organizational scholarship and how we, in working in organizations, can really build positive community and culture where people can thrive. And it's because of the work of all of you uh, that we are really uh, the center uh, of excellence in that conversation. And so from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate everything that all of you have done uh, to get to this moment. And this is just a moment in time, and I, I could not be more excited uh, about the future of where this is going. The incubator uh, was uh, founded in 2002, uh, and Wayne, I think you were the architect uh, of the incubator. And uh, when I walked in, I asked Wayne, uh, you know, did you ever imagine uh, that it would result in this type of community? 
Uh, and it, this is really special. Uh, the incubator, uh, this is our 200th incubator. Uh, and over those 200 moments in time, bringing together faculty, staff, students, thought leaders from around the globe to come together and share ideas and engage in research and really conversations about how can, in some sense, how can we make the world a better place where people can thrive. That's special. That is special. And so it's a great honor in serving as, as dean of this institution where we have an incubator like this, where we can bring this community together. Uh, this is the type of uh, activity, the type of community that makes the University of Michigan, not just the business school, but the University of Michigan a really special place. Uh, and so I want to thank you. It's not only created this environment where people like us can come together and talk about ideas, it's made us better as an organization. Uh, there have been cases written about uh, our journey in building a positive community and a positive place where people can thrive in this workplace. And so the ideas that we discuss and the ideas that we research, we're actually testing them here. We're putting them into practice and learning as we do. And that's pretty special as well. So uh, I just wanted to stop by. I unfortunately cannot stay. Uh, I have to uh, go home and pack for a, a trip to Antarctica where I'm leaving tomorrow. Uh, but I would love to stay. But uh, I, I, I hope you have a wonderful 200th. Uh, Dan is doing some amazing work on mental health and well-being in, in college student environments. And I know it'll be a thought-provoking session. So thank you very, very much for everything. OK, so for this very special occasion, I've been working very closely with Mari Kira, the director of research at the Center for Positive Organizations. And we decided to develop a really special uh, session here. Now, it's um, special in many respects, but in this case, it's special because uh, Dan Eisenberg, uh, his research he's talking about today is actually fully baked. It's not half baked. It's fully baked today. So Dan is the S.J. Axelrod Collegiate Professor of Health Management and Policy at the University of Michigan. And he completed a BA and PhD in economics from Stanford and then did a postdoc in mental health services and policy research at UC Berkeley. So he is coming from the Sunshine State and somehow the University of Michigan was able to persuade him to come here and uh, tolerate the Michigan we uh, weather. Um, but he's been with the School of Public Health since 2004. So he has been a full professor at the school since 2010 and the director of the doctoral program in health service organization and policy since 2011. And he's a leading scholar in the area of mental health services for college students with over 100 peer review articles and numerous uh, WG grants and NIH grants uh, for his work in this area. So in, in recognition of his early career research in 2010, he was awarded the Thompson Prize for Young Investigators by the Association of University Programs in Health Administration. So he is the founder of Healthy Minds Network, which he's going to talk to us about today. And it's an annual web-based web survey that uh, examines mental health among college students with over 180 university and colleges taking part in this survey. So data collected from the Healthy Mind Network has been really instrumental in understanding the effectiveness of university mental health resources. So please help me welcome today, Dan Eisenberg. All right, is it? Thank you. Did I manage to get my mic on? Okay, good. Uh, thank you so much, Amy, for that nice introduction. And thank you very much for having me here. I think this event for me is, uh, is sort of uh, this university at its best in, in, in my experience because I, just from the people I know in the audience, I can see uh, folks from the depression center in psychiatry and Wolverine Wellness at University Health Services from ecology and evolutionary biology and, of course, the, the Ross School. Uh, and, the Center for Positive Organizations, I've been, I've been aware of your center for a long time and have heard many great things. And many times 
I've been told I should, I should connect more with people here. And so when I received the invitation, I was excited because uh, now, I, now I really have a chance to, to connect. And my, I, I would actually argue, I'll show you, I'll show you what kind of an overview of our research over the years. I would argue that in, in some respects, it is still half-baked. So in the spirit of the incubator series, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for conversation and ideas and starting new collaborations, exchanging ideas. And then specifically, what I think is half-baked about what we've been doing is that we haven't sufficiently drawn upon some of the principles of positive organizations to think about how we can improve student mental health. And so I think intuitively, it's clear that and in fact, there is, I know, there is quite a bit of research demonstrating the link between po positive organizations and some of the kind of founding principles uh, of that field and well-being and mental health. But I don't think that connection has been applied to a great extent for college populations. And I think co college populations in campus settings makes a lot of sense, uh, as you know, for, for thinking about kind of how can we get, create a positive organization, a positive community. There's all kinds of interpersonal uh, relationships and, and sources of support that we could leverage uh, as part of strategies to, to improve student well-being. So I'm hoping that some of what I present will spark ideas and I'll leave plenty of time for discussion so that you can share some of those ideas and, and, and ask questions if you like about how some of the work might fit with your perspective. So I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time defining, this is kind of a typical uh, public health uh, approach, is first of all, let's, let's define what's the problem, the public health issue or problem or opportunity from a positive standpoint that we're looking at, and then show some data that we've been collecting that quantifies what, what's going on in college student populations in terms of mental health and related factors. And then, based on some of this data, I'll show you some examples of projects where we're actually trying to look at solutions or, or interventions, programs that can help improve student mental, mental health in one way or another. But just to kind of preview, I have to, I, again, kind of building on what I was saying earlier, I think a lot of the interventions and solutions that we've been thinking about thus far are along the lines of identifying students in distress and helping them gain access to, to uh, mental health services or support, which is kind of a traditional approach to mental health, more, more kind of in the medical model. Um, but I, I think really what I would like to move more towards in my career is, 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 uh, is more of uh, looking at how the, the aspects of the, the environment, the organization, the community can support mental health. So it's not just about the, cert, the formal services that people receive. So, so what drew me, uh, I mean, as an economist, what I'm trying to, how I'm trying to think about this, this issue or opportunity is how can we invest most effectively in mental health and well-being of college students? So I'm thinking of it as investments because, of course, we have limited resources, particularly people's time. Uh, and so how can we make the best use of those resources to improve student mental health? And to get to that, the answers to that question, of course, we need to start at the bottom of this chart collecting descriptive population data, and that's a lot of what we've done to date, uh, which I'll, sh I'll show you some, some of the data to understand the strengths and, 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 and challenges in, in the population, and then move towards interventions and, and programs and evaluation. And all of this work, if you look on the right side of this diagram, uh, we, as much as possible, we've tried to do it in collaboration with practitioners, meaning student affairs professionals, count, uh, student mental health counselors, health providers, uh, administrators, so people making decisions about budgets or programs for student mental health, and policymakers, and, and of course students themselves. Uh, so just a little bit more about my background. So, so as Amy mentioned, my, my training is in economics, and uh, and then and then also public health as a postdoc, and now I'm in a school of public health. So, so I find student mental health to fit really well with that background and that perspective because. Uh, first of all, mental health. Mental health, I think, is a perfect public health topic and also an economic topic because it's, it's very much at the center of well-being and social and economic factors. Kind of every, everything that you, if you were to draw a map of things that we think influence people's well-being, 
mental health would be right in the middle because it, it's connected to almost any important factor that you can imagine. And then economics, again, as, as I was saying, I think for young people, mental health is generally the most prevalent health condition. If you look at mental health conditions as kind of a group, and so, and there's also so many different ways to influence mental health because it is at the center of that kind of conceptual framework. So economically speaking, there are probably great opportunities to make good investments. And then the question, the empirical question is, well, what are those investments and how, how good are they really? Uh, so the Healthy Minds Network is what we've kind of developed over the years. It's a network of college campuses and also individuals and, and nonprofits, foundations, researchers, advocacy organizations, uh, mostly in the U.S., but to some extent international, uh, where we're all working together to collect data, to conduct research, and then bring that research into practice, inform practice, and then kind of continue the loop where pra then practitioners inform what kind of research we do next. We, uh, so as part of what we're doing, we're, we're trying to go beyond just uh, sharing our work to academic audiences, other researchers. In fact, I would say Probably most of the, the majority of people who read our work, I would say probably not academics. It's probably more on the practitioner side, uh, the administrator side, the advocacy side, nonprofit side. So we, so we hold web, webinars, we create research briefs alongside our, that are kind of shorter, more accessible versions of our, our peer-reviewed articles. We hold an annual college mental health research symposium which is in March, and it's, it's sort of a pre-conference for the, a larger Depression on College Campuses conference, which uh, Stephanie over there is the main organi organizer for that, run uh, out of the Depression Center, but in partnership with the rest of campus. And so March 12th through 14th are those events, and uh, happy to say more about that if you have questions. We also partner with a number of organizations, as I mentioned, nonprofits, to kind of help, to help make that connection between the research and practice. So, uh, so there's the Healthy Minds Network, but, the, but what kind of started, the precursor to the Healthy Minds Network is the Healthy Minds Study. So Healthy Minds Study is a large survey study, uh, a web-based survey study, which we started in 2005, and then has just, at the University of Michigan, just as a pilot study with no, no particular plans to continue beyond that one survey study. But it went well, we collected a lot of data, uh, we published papers, there was a lot of interest, and then so it's grown into a national study, as Amy mentioned. Now I think we're actually up around 250 campuses that have been um, in the study at one point or another. Many campuses return multiple times into the study. And essentially the campuses are joining the study because they want data about their student population's mental health and related, and related, related factors. And so to give you a sense, I, you probably can't read this slide very well, but just to give you a sense that there's a, there's a large number of topics that the survey can cover. And a couple years ago, we switched to a modular format. So we have a few sections of the survey that are the same, the core sections that are the same for every school that participates in the study. So that would be background characteristics, mental health symptoms and status, and then mental health service use. But then beyond that, schools can choose which additional topics they want to explore in depth that they want to have modules or sections in the survey that their students see. And so those modules cover topics ranging from substance use, sleep, sexual assault prevention, um, physical health, campus climate and culture, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and so on. So it's actually a couple, a couple of these modules, I would say, start to get at maybe some of the, what you study in positive organizations, in particular, the campus climate and culture, which is really more about kind of the mental health-related climate, like do students feel like it's a supportive environment in terms of mental health? And, and then the diversity, equity, and inclusion module, which is a newer module, but a lot of schools are now participating in that, which is similar to some of the climate studies that have, uh, surveys that have been conducted at the university recently. We get at issues such as how students' identities uh, interact with their experience in a campus community and what kind of, are they experiencing discrimination? Are they experiencing daily, kind of daily hassles? Are they feeling like it's a supportive environment um, for themselves and for students with other uh, identities. Also, are they, are they, what's their awareness and the perception of the resources and the initiatives that the university is actually doing in these areas? We, um, we, then, we then, so we collect the survey data at these campuses um, 
and then we provide the data back to the campuses in data reports. We try to make nice uh, glossy data reports. We, we actually uh, hired an undergraduate graphic design student several years ago to design the template because that, that was beyond our skill set. Um, so you can just see a little sense of that there. And then we also, um, on our website, and you can do this at your leisure whenever you want, go to, to data, data.healthymindsnetwork.org and you can log in as a guest and you can view our national level data for any year or any combination. You can break it down by different demographic groups. Um, you can look at not, not every single measure in the survey, but at some of the core measures in the survey. So that some of these next charts I'm showing you are just kind of output from this uh, data website that, that you can go into and look at more if you'd like. And also the schools can have their own login so they can look at their own schools population data and even compare it to, to other schools. The other schools are de-identified, um, but they can look at each other's school as another kind of data point that they can see where they fall in the distribution. So here you can see, for example, that depressive symptoms have been increasing over time. And perhaps what drew some of you to this talk is just that could, because you have a general awareness that student mental health issues are on the rise. There's been plenty of media reports on that, on that kind of making that claim, and as well as research from our, including from our group. And that just, I would generally agree that there, the evidence overall suggests that mental health symptoms are on the rise. Uh, even more, so, so I'll, I'll show you, just give you a taste of some of that, that, those data points. So here, depressive symptoms, the percent of students who have a positive screen for major depression, just based on a, a brief screen, asking about symptoms of depression uh, has been on the rise, going from 8% now on up to in the range of 15 to 20% the last couple of years. Um, similarly, with anxiety symptoms, they seem to be on the rise in terms of prevalence of positive screens. Uh, eating disorder screens as well, similar picture. Now, uh, this group might be particularly interested in positive mental health, so not just talking about the kind of the, the, end, the end of the spectrum where people are struggling, but in fact the other end where, where people, because uh, it's useful to distinguish between uh, what you, what's defined as positive mental health versus maybe kind of just medium mental health, not just distinguishing between this, this kind of disordered or clinical diagnoses versus others. And so by a measure, a flourishing scale developed by Ed Diener. Um, we, and, and we, I, admittedly, we, we kind of had to pick a cutoff because it, it's more intended as a continuous measure, but we picked, we picked the cutoff just so that we could then have a binary uh, variable to look at over time. And similar to the previous pictures, mental health does seem to be declining in this population over time. Now I think what's even clearer, I, I guess I, I'm a, I, when I say that mental health is getting worse in college populations, I am always, always feel like there has to be a little bit of a qualifier because mental health is inherently self-report. It's a subjective experience. And I think there, you could probably part of what's going on is that young people are more open or willing to actually report symptoms or interpret what they're experiencing as consistent with, with, with symptoms because the, the symptoms some of them are, are they're, they're, they're really pretty subjective. They're, 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 there's, it's not, there's not like a, you know, two people could be kind of maybe experiencing something very similar and report very differently. Um, but therapy and counseling use is an objective measure. The counseling center knows exactly how many people go into their doors. And I think we can trust that the reports on our survey are also objective. Um, when we ask students about whether they've received mental health services in the previous year, not just on campus, but in general. And so that trend is definitive, I would say, and it's been going way up. And that's, and it's been, go that's been happening at Michigan. It's been happening at probably nearly every institution across the country. Uh, institutions are consistently reporting that the demand for services is going up 5 10% per year, sometimes even more. And they're hiring more and more mental health providers, but, but it, in mo most cases, it never seems to be enough to kind of keep up with the rise in demand. And uh, you know, as to why that demand is rising, I think part of the story is the increased symptoms that I showed you. I think a bigger part of the story is simply increased, uh, well, kind of reduced stigma or, or imp improved attitudes, improved openness, improved familiarity 
uh, increased knowledge about services. Young people are now growing up in a generation where if they themselves are not seeking, using mental health services, they, they probably know people who are. It's just, it's just kind of a, it, it, it's a different era in terms of the, how common it is and how normal it is. Not to say that stigma has gone away entirely, but I think it, it does look different. And we have some data that will show you on that. Now, even though service use has gone up quite a bit, still, by our, according to our data, if you look at, well, what percent of students among those with positive screens, so for anxiety or depression, for example, what percent of the students are actually receiving mental health services, it's still less than half. So there's still a very large proportion of students who are struggling with their mental health and not receiving services. I, I would never argue that that number should be go up to 100%. I don't think, I don't think it, it probably doesn't make sense for everybody struggling with mental health problems to kind of immediately seek mental health services. There are many other things that can help with mental health. Uh, and for many people, they, they are more transient issues that, that, will dis, that will go away, resolve without professional care. But I think the fact that it's only still about one out of three is still concerning. So I think still increasing access to care and help seeking is still an important issue um, I, I mentioned stigma seems to be going down. Not only does it seem to be going down, but it's, it's actually quite low. The, 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 so the, the relative trend is down, but the absolute level is also quite low, at least according to our admittedly very simple measures of stigma. So we ask, for example, in the survey, indicate your agreement with the following statement. I would think less of someone who's received mental health treatment. And now it's only 6% of students who indicate any level of agreement with that statement. So the vast majority are saying, I disagree. I don't think less of someone's received mental health treatment. Now, of course, there, there's significant um, concerns about social desirability bias when you ask questions like that in a survey. And, and I do think, I think at the, at, at the least we can say students recognize kind of what the socially acceptable uh, attitudes are about mental health services, which may be different than in the past uh, as to whether people truly kind of live those attitudes. That's a different question which we can't get at with our brief survey. Um, here, just a piece of data about related to experiencing discrimination. Have you, have you experienced discrimination uh, in the past year? Um, do I have the full wording? No, so, it, so it's, so it's, we, we asked, have you experienced discrimination related to your race, ethnicity, culture, or religion, I believe, is how we ask it. So it's not kind of a full question about, uh, we've, we've updated it more recently. But, but you can see that different groups of students experience, have different prevalence rates of discrimination. So for example, black African American students are the most likely to report experiencing discrimination in the past year. Um, this chart here is just each bar, I know it's really small, but each bar is a, is a campus in our data set aggregated over the years. And the point of this is to show that there are, you know, not, not all institutions are the same. This is the percent of students reporting suicidal ideation, so serious thoughts of attempting suicide in the previous year. And you do have um, some campuses where the prevalence is pretty low, it's under 5%, a few campuses under 5%. And then you've got several campuses that are up around 20 to 25%. So you do have kind of outliers on each end. At the same time, the, the vast majority of the schools are in a reasonably narrow band around, say, 10 like 8 to 12%. The majority of schools are in, are in that band. So, so while well, I think it's easy to kind of jump to the assumption that, well, you know, it's maybe like competitive, um, Ivy League schools are really stressed and have really high rates, and other schools like University of Michigan might be quite low. It's actually, I would say overall, when we look at differences across institution types, they're pretty mild differences. And you do find you know, small numbers of schools that are kind of outliers, but overall, I would say it's a more of a common experience at the institution level than, than, kind of a, than a heterogeneous experience in terms of student mental health. So we're, we're all kind of facing roughly similar issues, with, with some exceptions. 
Um, we, we've, uh, campuses have found it helpful for us to translate some of our basic findings into an economic case for student mental health services because often the motivation for schools to collect this data is to document more carefully the need or the, the kind of the or the case for investing more in student mental health for expanding services. It's often maybe the counseling center or the health center that wants to say to the higher administration, the campus leaders, you know, look, this is, this is, an, this is a serious issue and this is kind of how serious it is in terms of some numbers and, and you know, we need to think about new programs or new resources. And so we've helped with that argument by translating some of our data to an economic case based on, based on some of our research that shows that depression in particular predicts uh, student attrition. And so when you have student attrition, then that means potentially lost tuition for an institution and, all, and probably more importantly, lost, uh, lost economic productivity for the students themselves. They have few, lower educational attainment means lower lifetime earnings, lot lower kind of productivity from an economic perspective. And uh, I think there's a sense that, that while not necessarily everybody out there appreciates in, in higher education appreciates the value of addressing mental health by itself, once you link it to economic outcomes, then, then it, you sort of you kind of increase the consensus about the importance. Okay, so let me, um, I'm going to turn to just a few examples of solving the problem, which are intervention studies that we've done. <coughs> um, so first of all, We've looked at gatekeeper training, which is training non-mental health professionals to recognize more effectively uh, mental health issues in their community and then have supportive conversations. So resident advisors, for example, would be an obvious kind of gatekeeper. And we did a large randomized trial, actually with disappointing results, where uh, the resident advisors who received the training felt more competent and knowledgeable based on our outcome data, but they actually it didn't translate to any, any evident behavioral outcomes. There was no increased referrals or increased conversations or increased service use among students who were struggling in those communities. So that, we, I mean, we can get into that in the discussion, but uh, I, our, we did not conclude that we should abandon gatekeeper trainings by any means, but I think our, our study suggested that we need to do better and do something a little bit differently with our gatekeeper approaches than maybe we are doing uh, at a lot of places. There's also a study, this is led by Cheryl King, in psychiatry and psychology, looking at specifically at suicide prevention and students with elevated suicide risk and online intervention to identify students at higher risk and then use motivational interviewing to encourage them to, to seek, uh, to look at their options for professional help. That, that's a, an NIH study that's still ongoing, but it's, it's wrapping up soon, so we'll have results finally after a long period. But we did have a pilot study several years ago that had some encouraging results, which is you know, why we're doing the larger study. Um, we've, we've done some work uh, looking at brief videos that either uh, promote coping skills, simple coping skills like uh, meditation or reframing negative thoughts. Um, also videos encouraging help seeking, showing maybe a student, a real student, or a fictional student in some cases uh, seeking help for mental health concerns, kind of the struggle of, of help seeking and how that led to a more positive outcome. So many of these studies, uh, these videos are now still being produced as part of the Athletes Connected projects, which focuses on the student athlete community. And a, a number of these videos I think are wonderfully done. I, I, I don't have anything really to do with the video production, so I can't claim credit. But um, I think a lot, there's some really nice videos featuring student athletes and their stories that I think have resonated with the student athlete community but also the U of M community more broadly and, and, and community outside of U of M. We're currently, we're just starting up a new NIH study um, looking at online cognitive behavioral therapy. Can online therapy supplement the current resources that student, that student, that campuses are providing in terms of student mental health? Uh, we're, this is motivated in large part by the fact that campuses, see, I think campuses have become frustrated, campus leaders in particular, frustrated with the fact that student mental health concerns seem to be rising endlessly and counseling centers are hiring more people endlessly and yet it never seems to be enough. And so I think there's a, there's a thirst for, for a new or different solution to supplement the important resources that are already in place and online services is a logical place to look. They're, they're highly scalable. They don't cost a whole lot per person. 
Um, and especially if we can kind of use them in a more preventive way, maybe reduce the number of students who reach a crisis point and really need uh, in-person services, then, then, then that might be a nice mix as a population approach. So we're testing that out, just starting a, a multi-year study for that. Uh, and then the last couple examples, um, we're, so because the Healthy Mind study, we've been screening each year tens of thousands of students around the country. I've always felt a little guilty that we haven't, uh, we're asking students for 20, 30 minutes of their time, getting valuable data from them, but not really providing much in return. We do at the end of the survey give them a page that sort of personalized feedback, just automated feedback based on their screening results, and we give them a list of resources for that they should, could, could consider for mental health, but that's, I mean, that's not a lot. And so we want, we're thinking about, and we're partnering with the Office for Academic Innovation here at U of M, um, to think about how can we give them something more engaging and more tailored, more useful at the end of the survey. Once we have a fair amount of information about them and their concerns, can we offer resources, particularly online resources, because online resources are expanding and are increasingly effective and useful um, to supplement what they might already know about. Just, you know, they pro most students already probably know about CAPS and, and UHS and, and Wolverine Wellness at U of M, but there's some other resources out there that are harder to make sense of, because, particularly online, because they're evolving so quickly and they're not U of M specific. Uh, and then la last example, we're thinking also about how can we integrate an approach to mental health through academic advising. And we're, so we're calling it wellness advising. We're probably not the only ones to use that kind of term. Um, but the idea, this is a project that, an idea we've had for many years, and I know we talk, I've actually talked with some of you in the audience about it at one point or another. But now we've finally been, we're able to pilot it at Loyola University in Chicago in partnership with a researcher there named Colleen Conley. Um, and I'd say it's been a mixed success so far. It's, it's, uh, I think we're, we're seeing some inklings of success. But the idea of this project is that given that there's a large number of students out there who still um, have mental health concerns and are not seeking help, what else might we do to kind of trigger a greater appreciation for mental health? And because actually I think because I don't, I don't, I would say stigma I think is not the main barrier to help seeking for students. I think it's more along the lines of a form of inertia and, and, and sort of a lack of salience and the fact that just like with diet, exercise, sleep, there are all kinds of things that we know about and we have maybe reasonably positive attitudes about those health behaviors, but we don't fully engage in them because as, especially as college students, there are a lot of other things coming at us in our, our, our life. You know, we have a schedule, we have classes, we have exams, we have assignments, we have parties, and so on. Um, mental health, taking care of one's mental health is not on the Google calendar, at least maybe not, maybe for some of you, because this is a progressive crowd, but, <laughs> but uh, for most college students, it just doesn't make it. And, and so there's not really any kind of commitment device to mental health. And so I think some of the concepts, like from behavioral economics, were kind of a nudge, or re kind of reframing decisions, reframing the default could, could be helpful. And a lot of students, I think, would be open to that. And I think academic advising is this kind of an infrastructure. It's sort of a default routine that people are naturally going into. And, 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 and mental health relates to academic success. So if we can leverage that connection in this infrastructure that already exists, then I think we could probably go a long way towards encouraging health-seeking behavior for some of the students who are not seeking help. Uh, so that, that concludes my slides, and I'm looking forward to discussion. Thank you. Yes. So you have data in this study, or collecting data. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Are you collecting data, or do you have data that um, shows the association between mental health or well-being or healthy minds and, say, academic performance or uh, career success or flu? or heart disease or anything else that is outcomes yeah. in addition to the the mental health measures yeah, yeah. Um, so what we have is we, we we have we have some we have some data looking at showing how mental health correlates with say grade point average so academic success in that respect and it's not just actually if you just look at um, 
if you're just take a look at a if you're just look at people's cumulative GPA and then look at how they answer a mental health screen, you're you're not necessarily going to see much of a correlation there. Or even if you do, it, it it's not really hard. It's hard to interpret because it's you know it's kind of past GPA pa accumulate or past academic performance versus current mental health. So what I'm more interested in is does current mental health predict subsequent academic performance? And so when we look at that, we do see a, a, a correlation. Actually, it, it seems strongest when it's depression and anxiety co-occurring. Those are students who are struggling the most in terms of GPA. That said, it's, it's, not, it's not a massive correlation. And I think that speaks to the fact that a lot of students, a lot of students in our, in our university, in every university, are struggling with mental health and still getting by pretty successfully academically. They're, they're student, students are, they may be suffering psychologically, but still kind of producing, at least up for some period of time. And maybe at some point people, in many cases, do kind of reach a breaking point. But they, so, so it's not, it's not, it's not, it's far from a one-to-one -one correlation. But, so, so, but GPA is correlated. Also, as I mentioned, attrition, so whether people remain in college, being depressed, highly depressed versus not, uh, it's associated with about a two-fold risk of leaving an institution. You, but you also get at some other important indicators that I would love to be able to look at, but we haven't, like uh, physical health conditions, um, career success. We haven't followed people in our studies beyond college, but that would be, I think that would really strengthen some of what we're trying to say and some, some of what we're looking at. So, thanks. thanks. Thanks, Dan. That was great. Um, the uh, data you showed on increasing rates of depression and, and use of counseling and so on, and then Kim's question about uh, GPA. One of the things we've been talking a lot about here at the business school is anxiety on the other side yeah. of that, and what we perceive to be an increase. I don't think you had the, the data on the screen, but related to GPA, more of GPA is a causal factor on anxiety and whether you're able to tease out, A, whether that's happening, uh, and B, whether you've been able to tease out any of those relationships. Yeah. Um. I, I remember we did look at one point a little bit at whether what the grades that students got, whether that predicted kind of their, their mental health the next semester, what, so whether it kind of went in the other direction. It certainly makes sense. I mean, anecdotally, we've all probably experienced it or seen people wh who uh, their mood is greatly affected by their, their academic results. Um, I, I guess, uh, and I, I know also some schools, so medical schools, for example, have and maybe even Michigan here, um, have gone to an, a pass-fail, at least for certain years in medical school, to alleviate some of the pressure associated with grades, some of the competition. So I have, we haven't studied that, but uh, I think that does speak to sort of um, maybe kind of the principles of positive organizations and kind of more cooperative rather than competitive environment that we could potentially create. And, and I think a lot of campuses or units are, in fact, trying to do that not necessarily evaluating it, I think, in a, in a full way to look at how it impacts mental health, but it would make a lot of sense if it does. Yeah. Kind of going off that last question, I'm just curious, did these surveys include any open-ended questions that tried to ask people, you know, what, what gives you these uh, feelings of anxiety or what makes you most depressed, you know, kind of getting at the causal. Mm. Um, yeah causal factors for this in rise in depression and anxiety? Yeah, that's, um, so we, 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 not, we, we do have a couple of open-ended questions in the survey, but we, but we use those to ask about, well, one of them is um, ask about, for students who report uh, any use of services, if, ask if they have any more comments about their experience with mental health services. Uh, and then, and then, we, then at the end of the survey, we, we've had a general just kind of if you have anything else to share. So I think, and, that, and that's where a lot of students have talked about that, kind of what's going on. And often, of course, they, they'll talk about, um, we, you know, we haven't done any formal qualitative analysis with all that data, but, I, but just from kind of re scan, scanning those responses, they do often talk about events in their life, uh, the pressure, uh, and we've, we've also, we studied community colleges and, and, and students there especially talk about kind of, uh, issues, um, it's tr you know, stresses associated with poverty and financial stress. In, in general, we do ask, we ask a survey question about financial stress, kind of what your current financial situation is. Are you struggling? Is it comfortable? And that, that's highly correlated with current mental health. So that's one of the stronger predictors is 
financial stress for college students, which shouldn't be any surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was the five percent suicidal ideation? The five percent on the yeah. suicidal ideation was that from the survey or an incoming call? Uh, or or what? Or, uh, was it based on the survey? Oh, oh. And what yeah, was yeah, the yeah. criteria for what was considered suicidal? Oh, so that that's a simple survey question. Um, in the past year, have you seriously thought about attempting suicide? It's kind of a standard, brief question. And overall, the, yeah, the five, there, was a schools, there were schools as low as 5% prevalence, others up around 25%. The, the national average is around 10%. Actually, it's crept up to maybe more like 11 or 12%. And, and in case you're wondering, U of M tends to be right around the middle in terms of uh, prevalence of mental health conditions or screens. Um, and then a look and sort of towards the higher end in terms of service use. Not, not the very high end, but, but higher than average, which I think reflects that we do have higher than average resources for students here. Hey. <laughs> that was great. I can sit back. Oh, not. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Daniel. That was so good. Okay, so having been here since 2004, I want to focus on U of M for a second. Um, I'm part of a team of people that's thinking about sort of what is the future of undergraduate education, what should it be here, what value should underlie it, and well-being keeps coming up as a value that should really underlie everything we do in terms of undergraduate education and frankly graduate education here. So if having been here for 14 years, if you could change a few things about the college environment, snapping your fingers, right, to make it more positive for students, what would it be? <laughs> because we know that college students, like young adults who go to college, have gen better mental health than young yeah. adults who don't go to college, right? So yeah. just by going to college, we know they're doing better, generally speaking, than those who don't. Mm -hmm. But there are things about the college environment that really are taxing for students, right? So I know some universities get rid of grades for first-term students because that is a huge stressor at transitioning to college. So just some things come to mind that you think these are obvious things we can do to yeah. improve the environment so that we're not actually causing harm. Yeah. To students mental health. Yeah. Well, I was hoping that this group would help me answer that <laughs> question, but, but I'll, I'll also share a couple of thoughts, just really speculative, but I think things that we'd like to test more with our data or other projects. Um, I think, but as I said in the beginning, I, th I, I suspect that what could be most powerful and also modifiable has to do with interpersonal kind of support and dynamics, different layers of it, you know, with peers, with um, with the you know, academic personnel and faculty. So I think whatever we can do to create kind of more, and as you know, Carrie, because you, you, know, you studied higher education, your PhD, this kind of fits in with a general higher education literature looking that focuses on student involvement and engagement. Like, I think that, a, that which is typically focused on student success, academic success, but I think also student well-being fits right into that, as you know well. So. Whatever we could do to foster more meaningful relationships, more supportive connections for students, you know, and and, uh, and, and I think U of M has some some pieces of that that are that we could potentially build on, like the Wolverine Support Network, mm -hmm. which some of you might be familiar with. It's a student um, initiated program that's now in collaboration with the CAPS that brings together groups of students on a regular basis with facilitation by trained peers and CAPS oversight to talk about mental health related issues, but also kind of life issues. Um, actually, I, see, I don't, I don't really know what, what interventions are feasible and effective in terms of affecting the interpersonal uh, environment, but I, that, that's where I feel like collaboration potentially with the center here could be really fruitful. It's kind of a general answer. <laughs> Hi, do you have any uh, data or insight on graduate student populations, both masters and PhDs? Yeah, so they're always included in our surveys. So we, we typically do a random sample of full university population. So a place like U of M, which is about, I think, one third graduate professional students would have about one third of our sample, actually a bit more because graduate students tend to have higher uh, response rates. Um, they appreciate the research maybe a little bit more from their own experience. Um, so we have plenty of data, and I guess just a couple of facts that we've observed. Contrary, I think, to a lot of people's expectations, uh, actually we find that the prevalence of mental health 
positive screens, like for depression and anxiety, are actually a bit lower for graduate students compared to undergraduates. And that's actually, I think that, that's, that, that's surprising, I think, when people kind of come from at the, this topic from the vantage point of the graduate student is very stressful and unfriendly. And that's, I think, very true for a lot of graduate students, a lot of programs. But at the same time, uh, graduate students are older, of course, and mental health concerns tend to go down a bit with age, at least during this period of life. You think about kind of late adolescence into young adulthood. Um, and also, graduate students tend to have probably more kind of mature sources of social support. Like they might have families, they might, their relationships might be more stable. They're kind of, they've already gone through some of the transition to independence that can be very stressful and distressing for young people. And also, graduate students have kind of shown that they can survive and, and thrive in higher education. That's why they went on to graduate school. So, so I think there's some kind of offsetting factors. I don't mean to dismiss at all the fact that we could do a lot to improve uh, graduate school climate in terms of mental health. And in fact, uh, well, I don't, I'm going to just mention Megan Duffy over here, because um, she, she recently came to me to kind of talk about this and is interested in kind of um, talking with people around campus about that topic. So. Um, I think we're hoping to start a conversation. I don't maybe, maybe you can just say a couple words since I put you on the spot, if you don't okay. mind. <laughs> um, I guess it's all like you. Um, I'm an ecologist, so I'm somewhat outside my lane here, except I train grad students. Um, and so the goal is to see if we can connect people across campus who are trying to better support grad student mental health and um, see if we can sort of create a sustained dialogue about this over the course of a year, maybe through Rackham. I haven't actually gone to them yet. Um, but to, to in part so that we're not reinventing the wheel in each department or unit trying to figure out how to best support this. Like, let's get a lot of people who think about this together, come out with that, and then bring that to the different units. I wanted to speak to, is it Carrie? Is it your, Carrie's question? Uh, you know, I think that the, the meaning of a lot of the behaviors we ask people to do that can boost well-being but might be under the rubric of mental health or shoulds like exercising and changing diet. And so I think when we can start to redefine on a cultural level what the meaning of, of self-care is and how that can guide towards well-being, we can very easily shift the mindset through, I think, very simple uh, marketing principles and creating dialogues. Um, so just as an example, I just finished teaching a class of undergrads where they were looking to help other people exercise more. And through the process of trying to help other people learn to reframe it, they actually, in, in their reports, they were actually giving themselves greater self-compassion. And so I think it's, it's the frame that we're speaking to people about and that if we can um, kind of turn it into a flower instead of a thermometer, we can get more people engaged and interested and even enter through doorways of what used to be called healthy behaviors and might be called well-being boosting vehicles. So that's just a thought. Yeah. Do you mind if I ask a quick follow-up sure, question? Sure. Um, so related to the uh, graduate students, is this, I actually find this very surprising, um, is this gra master's level or can you distinguish between master's and PhDs? Uh, I mean we have, we can make all the distinctions and, um, and we even look at different fields of study um, and I don't remember all the details, but the basic finding is that both master's and PhD students overall, this national data, um, are a bit lower in prevalence for mental health concerns than undergraduates. Um, but, you know, then again, I, uh, what, what, I th what I think we haven't compared as much is sort of the, the, the climate and the, the academic related stress that come for, dif for different levels and there may maybe we would see, I'm sure we would see some kind of graduate school specific or more intense uh, sources of stress. And actually there was an interesting recent study um, by, I think it was led by some economics students at Harvard, PhD students at Harvard. Uh, so economic, and I can, I can vouch as a former economics PhD student, economics graduate school is tough. 
And just like a lot of fields, probably most fields in graduate school, but I think partic it's particularly competitive and it's very much an, an environment where, uh, very critical environment where, where mm -hmm. people get up in seminars and just get torn apart and, and nobody blinks because that's just what's to be expected. And so they, they, but I think they're also, even in economics now, I, you're, I'm starting to hear people talk about, and the studies come out, looking at um, mental health among graduate students, PhD students in particular, but also the climate. And like what kind of support are people getting from mentors? Do they feel like it's a supportive environment for, in terms of mentorship, in terms of peers, in terms of competitiveness? So I think that's the direction to go for, at least in terms of, understanding what's going on more with graduate students and potentially also some uh, interventions or programs is to try to shift some of those dynamics in the culture. Uh, also, I, 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 Michelle, I also really like your point about the, just the mindset about self-care. And I think that somehow we need to figure out a way so that it becomes just more prominent, more part of the culture, rather than just something people kind of agree with and nod their heads to, but then mm -hmm. don't really attend to. Um, I'm also um, from ecology and sort of following up on Meg's question um, about looking into what's been done. I was wondering if you looked into, you know, uh, sort of inspired by the the graph on um, suicide risks, um, and I was wondering if you looked into the extreme, uh, looked into the environments um, at kind of the extreme high side and the extreme low side, because yeah. I remember this sort of looked kind yeah. of, yeah. although broadly flatlined, there were a group like the lower 10th percentile that might have been kind of really good at keeping um, suicide yeah. rates low. I, so, yes, so we, I can't say that we really have looked closely. I mean, I've looked at kind of some, some of which schools are those schools, but, I, but actually investigating what's going on with those schools, not that much. I can say, at least on the high side of high, high, very high prevalence of mental health issues, a lot of those schools actually are art and design schools. There's a whole national coalition of art and design schools that have really latched on to our survey study as a way to document what's going on and demonstrate, understand and demonstrate the very high needs in terms of mental health. That They, they, they were already aware of it, I think, just kind of anecdotally and through their services that they provide. But now, now I think they have hard, pretty hard evidence that their their populations are unusual. It sort of fits the stereotype um, in terms of art-related fields and, and high prevalence of mental health issues. But I would say even for those schools, uh, we haven't. I can't say that we've answered this fully. But my my interpretation is more that it's really the the, the population that comes into the schools rather than kind of what happens once they get there. It's true that in art design schools there are demanding aspects, like a lot of kind of long pro projects often done in, in isolation for much of those projects and a lot of kind of being evaluated, kind of big moments of like you have the semester long project and then it gets evaluated and, and, and so there's a lot of stress, but I think even when we look at students just entering art and design schools, they're already a higher risk group. So I, that's why I, I just, I, when I look at, when it, interpreting is, differences across institution, I think, has to be done with some nuance because I think mostly they're driven by different composition of students coming in. And so it's hard to tease out kind of what, how the environment and what the schools are actually doing plays into it. And that's where I think probably we need to do really more kind of um, controlled experiments or kind of make sure that we have the right comparison groups and look at longitudinal data rather than just kind of cross-sectional comparisons. Uh, hello, Dan. I'm over here. Oh, sorry. Hi. <laughs> so thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Mari. I'm a, a research director at the Center for Positive Organizations, and I would like to thank you for all the great ideas you have been throwing at us, and what we can do in this arena. And uh, yeah, it's exciting to think how we at the Center can, can also work and, and uh, help students and with mental health questions. Uh, so my question to you is, when you think about your data and look at your data across the years, mm -hmm. and remember at Sensor we are really big on building strengths, so uh, my question would be what has been the most hopeful development in your data? What has been kind of things that have improved and make you excited about things? Because we looked at the, the serious situation, but is there something you can point out that is very yeah. hopeful? 
Yeah, thanks. That's a good, a good reframe of uh, <laughs> this research, line of research. Um, well, I guess, I, I think one, 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 certainly one hopeful, as I mentioned, it does seem like students have very, overall in the population, have very positive attitudes about mental health services, or, or at least they don't, general, very few students hold overtly negative attitudes. But I, but I think just from also just our interactions with student mental health organizations, it's very clear that students not only have, I mean, the students really do have positive attitudes. They have a lot of knowledge and a lot of motivation, a lot of interest to actually participate in, um, in, the, in the solutions or in the, in the interventions or programs. And in fact, there is uh, an organization called Active Minds, for example, that's student-led advocacy groups with hundreds of chapters nationwide. And uh, they're not the only group, but they're probably the largest, where student leaders are addressing mental health in their communities themselves. Um, so I think I would say a, a, real, a big strength or asset is that there's the very community that we're talking about has a lot of energy and knowledge and interest in doing something about it. Um, and so again, kind of going back to like, my answer to Carrie's question about what you know what what would be kind of the most uh, helpful thing that we could do, I suspect it has something to do with interpersonal support and dynamics, and also actually involving student initiative and leadership and energy um, as part of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so just a couple announcements before we close. Um, so the next Positive Link speaker series that uh, we're going to have at the center is going to be Stephanie Creary, who will be talking about building inclusive workplaces. So please come and join us for that on uh, January 29th. And we're also hosting a two-day mindful leader training session called Search Within Your, Inside Yourself, which I've attended to. I can attest that it is wonderful. So if you're interested in that, we have more information out there on the tables. So in that closing, um, I just want to say thank you, Dan. I've known of your work for a long time, and I'm, I was really pleased to get a chance to actually hear from you. I also love the fact that you brought together so many people across the campus with this interest. Um, I welcome you to stay and dialogue. We have, you know, the part that I find really uplifting is that we have a lot of great minds here who care passionately about this. So stay and talk and, you know, generate solutions. I know I have thoughts on this. I know Betsy has had thoughts on this. Jane, who wasn't able to attend, has, has thoughts on this. So many of us do. So I think that we can find some solutions. So please join us as we celebrate the 20th session. We have coffee and cake that you can enjoy. So thanks for attending. <laughs>